So today's topic is a bit different. We're not just focusing on one artist. Instead, we're exploring a well-known music label. Yes, today we're talking about OVO Sound, the label owned by Drake himself. The label is quite an enigma. Almost everyone knows about OVO, but if you ask them to name any major artist other than Drake on the label, they might just scratch their heads. Sure, Drake made OVO into an international powerhouse, but from the outside looking in, he hasn't put much effort into developing new artists and promoting other talents. Let's take a closer look at OVO's history. It's known for missing out on The weekend, a weird episode with I Love McConan that raised a few eyebrows and failing to sign the up and coming artist Ice Spice. This raises a few questions. Why is Drake seemingly more supportive of rappers and singers he's not personally connected with, while the artists on his label seem to be on the back burner? Why hasn't he managed to produce another star from his label? And what really happened with I Love McConan? His career was taking off, then he just vanished from the hip hop scene. Today we're gonna try to answer these questions, so sit back, relax, and let's get started. What up guys, Ali here and welcome to Ali Talks Music. Add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music as well. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now let's get into the video. So let's wind the clock back to where it all began for OVO. We're zooming into 2006 when Drake dropped his debut mixtape Room for Improvement under the official label of All Things Fresh. Drake later rebranded it to October's very own which coincides with his birthday. Before OVO was a legit label, it was a loosely knit Toronto collective that Drake used to grow alongside his career. He featured OVO heavily in his music, lyrics, performances, and even merch. The gang mainly consisted of Drake himself, a long-term collaborator and producer named Noah, Forty Shabib, and a bunch of artists and designers. OVO even had a website, a blog, a limited line of branded apparel, and an annual music fest in Toronto before they really got going. Finally, around 2012, Drake officially launched the imprint with his pals, Forty and Oliver. Right off the bat, they signed a five-year distribution deal with Warner, which was later expanded around 2017. I was in this shop called Nomad, and there's this mob of people coming in, and the owner there, Jazar, he was like, yeah, this guy Drake's coming in. And I'm like, who the f is that, you know? Once the label was up and running, Drake wasted no time in recruiting folks. He began with his longtime collaborators, Boy Wonder, T Minus, and Mike Zombie, signing them on as in house producers around late 2012. Of course, Drake was the first artist, but due to his deals with Republic, Young Money, and Cash Money, he couldn't freely release music under OVO. Um, well, you know, my loyalty obviously lies with the people who gave me. The platform my first shot so that's really where that line comes from uh, despite you know how things may have ended up um, I, I'm like I, I'm always so grateful for those three people um, yeah I'm, I mean I'm, I'm always I'm always gonna be uh, involved with like the you know cash money young money imprint uh, like you know my loyalty like I said always lies there it was until around 2018 when Drake was able to leave Young Money and Cash Money and start releasing projects on his own label. In the meantime, there was a lot of gossip about who Drake would sign first. People speculated it would be The Weeknd, another musician from Toronto who appeared on Drake's Take Care. However, those dreams were shattered when The Weeknd signed with Republic and his own imprint, XO Records, around 2012. At the time, rumors of a beef began to circulate, despite Drake featuring on The Weeknd's debut album, Kiss Land. In a later interview with Rap Radar, Drake revealed why The Weeknd did not sign with OVO. He said the following. Well, with, with, with Abel, we, like, we had our run, you know, we, we, we had our, our, moment on t our moments on Take Care, 
um, and you know my features on his projects. And he just really came to me at one point, came to all of us and was like, look, like I, I don't want to sign under another artist because I feel like I could be just as big or bigger mm -hmm. and I want to start my own thing. And it was never like, I was, I'm, to this day, I'm always excited always super happy for for all those guys um and i never like had any resentment towards like oh you didn't stay on ovo that was never really like i'm not i'm not gonna say there weren't people that didn't feel a way about it but that was never my like my thing i never expected able to stay under ovo as soon as i heard him once express that he wanted to do his own thing so it seemed like the weekend was saying that he could be a bigger artist than drake and to be honest i've heard people compare the weekend to michael jackson so clearly The Weeknd was onto something. Now while Drake and The Weeknd did not really feud, they did not see eye to eye either. By 2013, Drake had managed to sign his first two Canadian artists, R&B singers Party Next Door and Majid Jordan. After signing these two new artists to his imprint, Drake started pushing out their music as well, beginning with Party Next Door's self-titled debut EP around 2013. This was soon followed by his debut album, Party Next Door 2, the following year. The album came out around 2014 and could easily be considered a flop. While it did go gold about 6 years later, around 2020, in the first week of its release it sold about 16,000 copies. Despite this, PND went on to be quite successful releasing another gold album and being a main writer on Rihanna's hit single Work. It seems like Drake was promoting PND more than the other OVO artists. But hey, that doesn't mean he was entirely hands on. Now when PND came out, a lot of people compared him to The Weeknd. People felt like because Drake had not signed The Weeknd, he signed PND, making PND appear to be a substitute for The Weeknd. Uh, All right, Joe party. has said for a long time, I got this Ivory King. Have at it. Joe has said for a long time now, and I got laughed out the room again. Oh, Joe, how could you say that? No, I don't feel like that. I mean, I just, now nah, you bugging with that one, son. <laughs> uh I said that I think there's something that exists between The Weeknd and Party Next Door. But I felt like for the past few years, personally, The Weeknd has gone out of his way to step on any announcement or move that Party Next Door was trying to make. Eventually, Majid Jordan's debut EP came out, called A Place Like This, and PND dropped his third EP called Colors. Here's where Drake began to take a back seat in promotions. Majid Jordan's EP did not make a big splash, and Drake was notably absent from the project's promotion. Now let's move on to one of OVO's most successful and controversial signing. I love my Conan. Got the club going up on the Tuesday. Got your girl in the cut and she chooses. He released a self-titled EP with the singles Tuesday and I Don't Sell Molly No More, which caught the attention of Molly, Cyrus, and Drake. Drake's remix of Tuesday went viral and led to I Love McConan being signed to OVO, becoming the first non-Canadian artist on the label. Going up on a Tuesday, got your girl in the cut she chooses. 2015 saw the release of new music from the recently signed artists. But while Drake continued to feature them on his Instagram and at OVO events, he wasn't actively promoting their projects, which led to criticism from his own fans. The fans began to talk, and many people thought that Drake built OVO simply to promote his albums and himself over his other artists. By around 2016, it was very clear that PND was the only artist to release a project, an official studio album on OVO, with the rest only dropping mixtapes or EPs. But soon, the label dropped several debut albums, including Majid Jordan's self-titled album Division September 5th and Roy Woods' Walking at Dawn. Despite these releases, and despite being signed to Drake, these projects did not perform very well on the charts. Then around 2015, trouble began to brew between I Love McConan, OVO, and Drake. Look like views from the, or what's, what's that nigga album? 
what's that dumbass album with the sky shit? Uh, t take care or some shit. <laughs> he felt like the label was holding him back and not promoting his new music. The song Second Chance from his I Love McConan 2 project was meant to be a summer hit, but he ended up dropping it himself around November of 2015. Let's just say that did not sit too well with him. I Love McConan later went on to say that there were various forces behind the scenes that were keeping his music off of the radio. He claimed there was no money in music and also said that he barely saw Drake. Why you leave OVO? Cause I was underweight now. When I was overweight, they were fucking with me. That's what Oprah stands for, overweight only. Overweight niggas only. Fast forward to around April of 2016, and I Love McConan left OVO, choosing to remain on Warner as an independent artist. After leaving OVO, I Love McConan became very vocal about his time on the label. At first, I Love McConan went on to praise OVO and thank them for the opportunity to release music on a global scale. However, as time went on, I Love McConan went on to bash the label. Around June of 2016, I Love McConan performed a freestyle on Tim Westwood, which had a bit of mixed responses from the public. Aside from people clowning his bars, it was very hard to ignore the many disses towards OVO in the freestyle. Yeah. Motherfucker said I got dropped. Hey, boy, that soul got them hip hop. You know my album flip flop and take it to the tip top. Heard the label said they gon' put the kid on the shelf. That's a motherfucking joke. Boy, don't make me fucking choke. Fast forward to around the end of August 2016, when Drake and I Love McConan had an awkward encounter at the VMAs. But more on that in a minute. McConan then took to Twitter to leave fans with even more questions, since at this point not everyone knew what went down. He said the following, All I have is love and respect for everyone. I was there tonight to meet and greet everyone with love. This is so weird. All this internet shit is causing too much rumors and negative shit. I have joked before, but I have no issues with anyone on this earth. He then went on to say, I don't know what is all this about. I have no animosity towards you. What happened just now is beyond me. I hope we can talk about this. At this point, it was very obvious that I love McConan was talking about Drake. Now the rumor mill was milling and everyone thought there was some serious beef brewing. I love McConan came out of the closet around 2017 in January and by March, he began revealing information about the VMA encounter with Drake. Was he the first, he was the first rapper to really before uh Lil Nas X. McConan was the first rapper. Camp. But yeah, that niggas niggas so, immediately, okay. stopped, okay. niggas immediately okay. stopped fucking with him after that. Or According to I Love McConan, Drake confronted him at the VMAs in a very intimidating manner. He revealed that he was talking to other rappers when Drake and company approached him and threatened to mess him up at the after party. He said the following, It was in the middle of the goddamn after party at the up and down club. Everybody that was in there was in there. I'm in here around these Vanguard Awards and I'm accepted and I took pictures with Chainsmokers and g Easy and everybody and we all friends. And I'm here in the middle of the floor. No security. And they coming, and I just step to the side, and they see me and stop, and the biggest motherfucker in the game goes, woo woo woo, next time I'ma fuck you up. And all security and everybody stop like, what the fuck? And the guys with me was like, what you do? I don't have nothing to say, all I did was smile, and I guess they took that as a threat. I was confused like, it can't be little old me. I'm just a goddamned old record from way back then. What the f am I doing causing stresses and pains? Now I love McConan went on to diss Drake multiple times, but at this point, Drake was far superior and had more important things to deal with. So after all the drama with I love McConan, Drake seemed to back off. McConan turned into a one hit wonder and people assumed that Drake only signed I Love McConan to jump on the Tuesday hit record. Some people even believe that Drake's problems with McConan is the reason why he backed off from promoting OVO and the artists within the label. 
Drake kind of kept pushing his label and artist to the side, which ended up as a running joke in the industry. He signed Barker Not Nice and Plaza to OVO around 2017, but again, not much promotion from his side. He also signed Jamaican singer Pop Khan around 2018, and Barker Not Nice's debut EP for Millie came out. Then, things quieted down for a bit. In 2020, we saw a couple of EPs, Dem Times from Roy Woods, and Party Pack from PND. But mostly Drake focused on albums, PND's Party Mobile, Divisions, Amuse and Her Feelings, and Popcorn's Fix Tape were some of the big ones. Then we move on to 2021, and Drake is seemingly more interested in OVO, signing Canadian rapper Smiley and the first female artist on OVO, Naomi Sharon. Drake then went on to release Certified Lover Boy and Majid Jordan's third album, Wildest Dreams. Jordan's album was a flop, and many fans think this could have been avoided if Drake promoted the album even more. And here's where things start to really hit the fan. Smiley's debut album, Buy or Buy 2, did not chart, and Plaza followed my Conan out of the door. From then on, it seems like Drake has been focusing on his own music. 2022's projects include Drake's Honestly Nevermind, Division's Working on My Karma, and a collab album with 21 Savage called Her Loss. So far in 2023, we've seen Popcorn's Great Is He and Naomi Sharon's debut EP, Another Life. OVO has been an independent label since around 2022, and besides the occasional shout out by Drake, the label doesn't seem to be growing or getting much attention. A lot of people feel like Drake is afraid of finding a star that's bigger than him. He could have signed Tory Lanez, but he did not. Drake ultimately missed a big opportunity to sign rappers or singers the way Wayne did for him, which would have further solidified his legacy. But instead, OVO is more like a graveyard for artists that will never blow up. Artists that will never escape Drake's shadow. Drake is arguably the biggest artist in the game. So did he really need OVO or did OVO need him? So Oliver, at this time, is my roommate. And so I go home to the condo after hearing Drake and tell Oliver like, yo, I gotta find this guy, I gotta find this guy. And Oliver's like, oh yeah, I seen him, I seen him around, you know? So Oliver would run into him a couple times. Like they exchanged contacts. I called him, he didn't answer. Or I hit him again, he doesn't answer. In another couple weeks, Oliver's like, yo, did you talk to Drake? I'm like, nah, he never hit me back, bro. Like, what do you mean? And Oliver's like, yo, put your pride aside, like call him. I'm like, all right, fuck, I'll call him again, you know? And so anyway, I call him again and uh, finally like we connect and he's interested in engineering. He's, he wants me to run studio sessions for him. That's it for me, it's your boy Ali. What happened to OVO in your opinion? Let me know down below. Also add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music till next time peace. Oh.